are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about the mad woman or the Peterborough Ditch murders. Now, this is a case of a female serial killer who was on her way to being the most prolific of all time. Thankfully, she was caught, but not before causing a reign of terror. Not only did her motive not exist, she felt like it was something to do to have fun. Prison wasn't the end of the story either, with a serial killer's daughter coming forward, an escape plan, and a suicide pact. This one gets crazier and more disturbing the more we go on. Now, I also want to thank our longtime sponsor, Magellan TV. They have the absolute best documentary streaming service. I can watch so many true crime documentaries I've never heard of on there, and that is including one I recently watched, which was called Finding Lee, A Tangled Web. This one was about a college student kidnapped from the parking lot. It has to do with a ransom call and her father being so close to finding her. It's a heartbreaking tale, but it informs you of so much. And of course, that's why I like to watch documentaries. That's why I like to make them. And I just think that Magellan has some incredible ones on their site. If you want different genres, they have a whole bunch of different kinds rather than just true crime. If you do want to get away for a little bit, they have over 3,000 documentaries to choose from. So if you do want to try it out, just go to try.magellantv.com slash Brooke McKenna and that will be linked down below. But I also want to tell you guys about the true crime dream job that Magellan is offering at this very moment. Now, three people will be chosen to watch 24 hours worth of true crime documentaries, kind of document the whole process on social media, and then be paid $2,400 for it. That is right, you will get paid. You have to be in the US and at least 18 years old. I'll have the link below to apply because the applications do in the deadline for that is on May 5th. So go ahead and apply if you are wanting to, but I figured that I would bring it to any of you who are interested because I think it's a wonderful opportunity to get paid for your love of true crime. Please go ahead and apply if you want to. Check out my link for Magellan because you will get one month free if you go to try.magellantv.com slash Brooke McKenna. So thank you to Magellan for sponsoring this portion of the video. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2013 in England, so this is a more recent case than I usually like to do, but Kevin Lee was a 48-year-old father and husband who lived in Peterborough, Cambridgeshire. Now, I do want to say this is all places in the UK, so I'm so sorry if I butcher it. I am trying my best, but Kevin was a property manager as well as a landlord at Quicklet. He had kind of started this from the bottom up to help other people. That was really one of his biggest passion was to help people who didn't have enough money to help themselves. Kevin had a wife named Christina and he was actually her very first relationship, but they had been together for years and they had two kids. One was named Shiara who was 26. The other was Dino who was 15 years old. And Kevin was definitely an involved father and would take his son go-kart racing all the time. That was kind of their passion and they loved to do it together to spend time. They even designed a carting helmet together. Eventually, Kevin surprised Dino with his very own cart. He told him that there was a surprise waiting for him. Well, actually, before he even said there was a surprise, he said to go to the car and grab something for me. And so Dino did, and that is when he found his cart in the very car, and he was so, so excited. They were both so passionate about this, and Kevin wanted his son to succeed so badly that after a long days of work, he would actually come home and continue working, emailing possible sponsors for Dino for these races. I mean, they were the best kind of friends, this father and son duo, and when it came to people who weren't in his family, Kevin was also as nice and as hardworking and as kind. He was always said to see the best in people and want to give them a chance no matter what. He was said not to believe he was better than anyone or, you know, a step above. He helped people who needed housing, who had just got out of prison, and this was all able to be something he could do because he was a landlord. So Kevin was said to be also be headstrong, intelligent, and unique. And these were just a few of the kind things that were said about Kevin. However, on March 23rd, Kevin didn't return home from work that evening. No one could get a hold of him and they began to worry because Kevin was said to be the type that kind of came home the exact same time. He got some tea, he got in his pajamas, and he would either watch a movie with his family or he would do some work for his son, but it was always 
always about him being home during that time to be a part of the family. And so when Christina, his wife, started calling him and his phone was off, she knew deep down in her gut that something was very, very wrong. And when hours went by without a word from him, she then asked one of Kevin's basically business partners to get the phone records from Kevin's phone to see who he had been talking to, you know, the last person he had done business with to see if that would point in his direction. So the phone records came back and they all pointed to one number that he was calling over and over and over again and they were calling him. Now this kind of worried Christina. She had this feeling but also Kevin dealt with a lot of people when it came to his business and getting people housing and so this wasn't unusual. At this point she also asked Paul, the business partner, to give her the addresses of homes that they had that were vacant at the time so she could go around and see if he was at any of these. So she was going to each one and knocking on each door and she had a gut feeling her husband was not coming home but she wasn't finding anyone. No one was answering the doors so to her dismay the last thing she could think of to do was to call the police. That is what she did and she went back to search these homes with one of her friends and that's when she noticed that one of the homes that was previously completely dark now had a light on inside. So immediately she told investigators they came and they knocked down the door and they searched this home. They didn't find Kevin inside, they didn't find anyone inside, but they were instantly hit with a smell of bleach. And we all know what that means, including investigators, and it solidified their theory even more when they found blood on the floor. They went out back to the garden and that's when they found a blood-soaked mattress. Now at this point they did test the blood and it came back as not a match to Kevin. Now he was still missing, but it wouldn't be long until his body was found. This was unfortunately in the woods near a village called Newborough and the next day, after they were searching for him. This is when a man who was walking his dog came upon the body. Now, Kevin was already deceased, but he was also wearing a black sequined dress that was kind of up over his butt, like he had been posed face down with his dress up. Now, the stab wounds also went through the dress like he had already been wearing it. The medical examiner determined that the stab wounds on his neck and his chest that were about five of them on his chest was his cause of death. It had been a brutal murder with a humiliating disposal. Investigators didn't yet realize that this hadn't been the first murder, only the first body found. That's when investigators began looking into Kevin's cell phone records and one of the last people that Kevin was in contact with. Now, while they were waiting for those records to come back, they were also tracing the location of Kevin's phone. This is where they ended up locating his vehicle that was burnt, meaning all of the evidence was gone. Five days after Kevin's body had been found, though, two more bodies would be located nearby. This was on the outskirts of town near Thorny and these were two men who both had stab wounds as well and all three of these men had been thrown in a ditch. The medical examiner found that these two new victims had been killed much before they were actually found. In fact, one was killed on March 19th, 10 days before Kevin was murdered and then the other was murdered on the same day as Kevin which was March 29th. Investigators had actually found these two bodies on April 3rd. These two were identified as 31-year-old Lukas Labowiski, a Polish national who had been stabbed in the heart who didn't have any friends or family around, and that is why he was never reported as missing. There was also a 56-year-old veteran named John Chapman who had actually told his friends he was scared of being killed prior to this, but we'll get into that a little later. He'd been stabbed in the neck and the chest five times so hard that it actually broke the breastbone. John was said to be one of the loveliest people you could ever meet, but he had been brutally murdered and nobody knew why. The question, was this done by the same person, didn't really need to be asked because they were pretty sure it had all been done by the same person, all three murders. If a serial killer was on the loose and they had already escalated to murdering two victims in one day, they had a huge problem. Fortunately for them, in Peterborough, the killer had moved on, but for the next town, they were not going to be so lucky. Investigators in this town had no idea that a little more than three hours away, more attacks had started in Hereford. These attacks had actually started the day before these 
last two bodies I told you about had been found. So at this point, this killer only had one victim and then they had moved on, but they had already killed three people and were just waiting for the next two to be found. So investigators in Hereford were now looking into two separate cases of men being attacked and stabbed, and they were both dog walkers who thankfully, in some sort of miracle, survived. They could tell the story of what happened to them and that is exactly what they would do while still healing on literally a hospital bed. They were telling what had occurred that led them to this horrific, scary place that they almost didn't survive. You see, 57-year-old Robin Bereza had said he was out walking his Labrador dog and it was just like every other day. He was a retired fireman who had also been married to his wife, Pam, for 36 years. He was either with his wife or his dog and it was not something that he was in bad things or he was in bad places at bad times. He was walking his dog probably near a residential street. Now, suddenly a car stopped nearby, but he didn't think much of it because, of course, cars were going down these streets. But then he felt himself being punched in the back. That's what it felt like. And he turned around to see a woman who had a knife in her hand with blood on it. And he immediately realized that was his blood. He asked her what she was doing and she told him, I'm hurting you. I'm going to effing kill you. She had no remorse on her face and Robin began fighting back. He was kicking her, but this didn't stop her. It only slowed her down. And eventually he was able to get to the road to basically ask for help. But the woman continued to come after him and stab him. And then Robin saw that the car that had stopped nearby, there was actually a man inside and he was gesturing at the woman to get back in the car. Robin was referring to this man as big gentleman because of how large he looked, but this man didn't get out. He just told the woman to get into the car and then together they left, leaving Robin bleeding in the middle of the road. He began to walk towards home even though he had been viciously stabbed. He was bleeding. He didn't even stop at the doctor's office that he walked past as he walked home because all he could think about was getting home to his wife. He said, I wanted to get home to Pam. That was all I could think about. My house was uphill and I passed a doctor's surgery on the way, but I was determined to see my wife. I think probably in his mind, he didn't figure he was going to make it. And so the last person he wanted to see wasn't a doctor. It was Pam. And I think that is so extremely beautiful. But thankfully, when Pam saw Robin, she immediately got him help and he survived to have even more years of marriage with Pam. Robin was kept in the hospital five days after this just to recover and shortly after another man was attacked and by shortly after I mean like minutes after, like 10 minutes after this. John Rogers, a 64 year old man, was out walking his dogs one day same way that Robin was and he was on an uphill cycle path. Now suddenly he also felt what felt like a hit in the small of his back. And his reaction was that one of his neighbors or his friends had come up and was like messing with him, trying to scare him or get his attention. So he didn't really freak out, but he was shocked when he turned around to see this woman with a knife. That's right, a woman, same as last time. She didn't just stand there either. She continued to stab him. But before John could realize what was happening and fight back, he fell to the ground and the woman continued by getting on top of him and stabbing him. John then asked her nicely to leave him alone, but she had no emotion on her face at all and didn't respond. She continued on without listening or flinching. And when she saw the blood, she said that she better do some more. And she did. After being stabbed for what felt like forever and was actually 30 times, the woman got up and left with the bloodied knife and John's dog. She stole the dog. John couldn't get up. He couldn't ask for help, but he did crawl to the nearest path with people on it. And a woman thankfully saw him as he was dying and believed he wasn't going to make it. And she called for help and he was rushed to the hospital. He was airlifted and the doctors immediately went to work on his punctured lungs. And in some sort of amazing miracle, John made it out alive and spent the next 10 days recovering. Uh, she said something to fact of um, my boyfriend told me to do this and um, she also said oh look you're bleeding I'd better do some more um, I think I said uh, just leave me alone please please leave me alone but she didn't she just carried on what was her 
look like in her eyes, in her manner? Well, I couldn't really see much of her face, um, but she was very kind of, like I said in court, very sort of matter of fact about it all. You know, she didn't, she didn't appear to be showing any emotion whatsoever, really. And while both men had recovered physically, they were both struggling to recover mentally. Robin said that this incident affected his confidence, that especially when it came to going out running, he didn't want to go anywhere. And he felt he was a bit quieter than he used to be, just more reserved. And John, on the other hand, was saying that he kind of got a new passion for life out of this, that it was a change for him because he wanted to live every day like it was his last. He didn't want this woman to ruin his life. And... They were both changing and John even had to continue therapy on his hand from the injuries but he said I have enjoyed playing the guitar as a hobby since the age of 16 but I'm not the same standard anymore. I have lost the feeling in some of my fingers on my left hand due to the stab wounds and this is actually John recalling his experience. It's changed my outlook a little bit and, and that, you know I think I think you've got to make everything of every day because you don't know you could wake up in the morning and get run down by a bus, you know, it's, you don't know what's around the corner. So I try to make the best of, of every day. With three murder victims and two survivors, it didn't appear as though this killer was stopping anytime soon. But John and Robin were able to give a description of the woman and these matched. This was a female attacker that was around 5'5", and the one thing that stood out about her like a sore thumb was the fact that she had a giant tattoo. It was very identifying because it was on her face of a star and not many women have tattoos on their face or of a star. So she was a white woman with dark hair with this tattoo. They were also able to identify the car that stopped near them before the attack. And thankfully, they hadn't made it out of the area just yet. And so while investigators were searching frantically, trying to find a killer before she could attack again, a vehicle matching this description was located. This was only hours later on April 2nd, the same exact day, and investigators witnessed a man walking out of the vehicle, going up to a house and talking to another man. And they also saw there was a person inside in the back seat holding a dog holding John's dog. Now, this was a woman who looked a lot like the description that John and Robin had given. So she was immediately taken from the car and arrested. So investigators in Hereford actually had this woman in custody for the attacks and they weren't yet aware of the murders that had taken place in Peterborough. So this woman who had just attacked two men and was being charged with attempted murder was actually a spree killer who was showing zero remorse. Now I say spree killer, some people look at her as a serial killer, others say because everything happened so quickly it was more like a spree kill, but regardless, she was killing lots of people and she was a horrific person. But while being booked, investigators noticed that this woman was able to laugh and make jokes. She wasn't afraid of being caught. She was just charismatic talking to these officers. She seemed incapable of murder. She was kind. She was flirting with the officers, kind of playing with her hair and making jokes about how murder wasn't that bad and that it was just kind of like a Sunday roast dinner. <laughs> She was pretending to be this normal girl, yet Joanna Dennehy was anything but. You see, the woman that was in custody was known to be heartless and sadistic, yet she was also a mother. Joanna was 31 years old, but she was said to be a very sensitive child growing up. Her mother said if she would step on a worm, she would feel so bad about it. She would take it to bed with her and she would be so upset if it died. Her mother said she used to love everyone. She loved netball, she loved hockey, she was a good student, and teachers would say she was nice and polite to everyone. She came from a good family with a mom and dad and a sister named Mariah who loved her, yet she then left home at only 16 years old without graduating. Her mother said by that time she was a teenager and everything had changed. 
You see, she had started taking lots of drugs, drinking alcohol, partying, and she was known to be the school bully. She would manipulate the boys to do her homework, and if they didn't, she would be violent toward them. With the girls, she would threaten them that she was going to fight them, and then she would tell them that they basically needed to kill themselves. She also began dating a man named John Treanor, and this was after all of her behavior had started already, but he was actually five years older than her when she was only 16, but they had met when Joanna was walking her dog, and they began dating. She stopped attending school, and her teachers kind of tried to rein her back in, so did her parents, and nothing was working. She didn't want to be told what to do, and she refused to be, and that's when she decided to leave with her boyfriend and go somewhere else, even though they were without money and homeless. This led to a relationship that was anything but stable, and she became pregnant a little while after, and everything quickly went downhill. You see, Joanna began to show very strange behaviors and would have outbursts. When she was pregnant, she was doing really well with her alcohol addiction, but when she wasn't, it was the complete opposite. And she began carrying a knife. She had been in jail several times for drugs at this point. She was harming herself and she would disappear for large amounts of time, I mean years, where her child would have to be left with the father without ever even seeing their mother. Those who knew her weren't surprised that she had gotten in trouble and especially not for murder. This was even her ex-boyfriend, John. You see, Joanna and John Treanor had two children together by this time and Joanna wanted nothing to do with them. So John was raising them as a single father and before he was doing this, he said that Joanna would actually threaten the fellow moms that were at the kids' school when they were all on the playground, and so much so that she was told she could no longer be at the school, she couldn't pick up her kids because she would cause a scene and threaten everyone, scaring them to death. In fact, the violence got so bad that in 2009, she pulled out a knife and plunged it into the floorboards in their home in front of their children and was yelling that she wished she could kill someone. So the next day, John packed up himself and the children and left Joanna behind knowing that the children were not safe with her. But after the family had left her behind, she decided to move into her own place in 2012, a place where no one really knew who she was. Her neighbors nor her landlord were aware of her behaviors or that she had stayed in a psychiatric ward and been diagnosed with psychopathic, antisocial, and emotional instability disorders. Now, a woman named Michael Bowes lived next door and found her very pleasant and kind. She had appeared to be great with kids. She would talk to her all the time about anything. She was never rude at all. Yet another neighbor in the same building had the opposite feelings about Joanna. He said that he was very threatened by her, that she was a madman and that everyone should be scared of her. They shared adjoining rooms, so they basically had to share a bathroom. He was a 56-year-old retired veteran who was smiley and kind, but he had turned into this paranoid, terrified man. And Michelle, who was also his friend, who was the woman who lived in the building, didn't understand this fear because he was talking about it being Joanna who scared him. This man is a man we talked about before, John Chapman but it seemed as though Joanna was showing two completely different sides to those around her, including to another man who she was showing her more loving side to, and this was a man who was her landlord. She had just moved into this home, and like I said, it was the perfect place as Joanna didn't have a conventional job, and so it was cheap rent, but as I said in the beginning, Kevin Lee was a landlord, and he loved helping underprivileged people who couldn't afford proper housing. He welcomed in Joanna and even gave her a small job. It was said she, that he kind of had a crush on her. And Kevin wasn't scared of Joanna like John Chapman was because he was intrigued by her. You see, to Kevin, Joanna was this, this precious little thing who had had a rough life and who he had been told had went through abuse and horrible trauma by her father who actually went to prison for this. And then when he got out, Joanna killed him and that is why she was in prison. This in fact was all a lie, every single part of it, but it got Kevin's attention and his empathy. So Joanna began telling him about this murder and that she actually wanted to kill again. 
Now, she was telling him about this murder, but as far as we know, she never really killed anyone before this, so it's all thought to be a lie. Kevin heard all this. He wasn't afraid of her, like I said. He was infatuated by her. He even told his wife about one of his tenants who was a killer and wanted to kill again. Joanna began staying in these empty homes that Kevin had for free. This was because she had a friend that was this big strong man and so together they would go and basically kick out residents that Kevin needed to get them to leave or weren't paying their rent and so they basically went around and did his dirty work for him and so that's how she stayed for free but one of these homes she was staying in would become a crime scene but not for Kevin just yet. You see, Joanna was seeing Kevin, but she was also seeing other men, and that's when she came across Lucas Lebowski. Shortly after their first date, she took him back to her home, and before he knew it, she was stabbing him in the heart. Now, during this time, a little girl in the area also had told police that she had a woman come up to her and tell her to look inside a trash can. That is when this woman showed this little girl a dead body. This was thought to be Lucas. They had no idea if this was true or not, but this girl had been face to face with a killer and had seen Lucas's dead body prior to him being disposed of. Thankfully, it didn't appear as though this little girl was Joanna's MO, you know? It was not the type of victim she would go for, so she was safe, but it didn't mean Joanna was done killing. A week later, John Chapman, the one that shared a room with him or a home, accidentally walked in on her while she was in the bathroom and this made her very angry. So that is when she stabbed him while he slept. She wasn't done though because she wanted to see Kevin and he was more than happy to visit what was believed to be his mistress. He didn't know that this home was already a crime scene that had been cleaned up after the murder of Lucas and he would be deceased by the end of his date as well. While his body was found, his wife Christina just knew and investigators had also found a name on Kevin's phone. This was Joanne Dennehy and they quickly realized that this was a woman he was having an affair with and were wondering if this had anything to do with this, but her phone location was also near Kevin's car when it was burnt, destroying all of the evidence. Yet they couldn't find her because she was already in Hereford attacking other men. They did, however, find another name. This was of a man. He was also traced to that same location of Kevin's burning car. And so Joanna didn't do this completely alone. And they knew that even the survivors had seen a man in the car with her. So who was this man? Well, the name that they had found, the other name was Leslie Layton, who was a man. And he was interviewed because he was actually still found in town. And that's when he at first would not say anything. And then he gave up his friends and he said Joanna and a man named stretch were going to be heading east. These two became wanted individuals immediately and little did investigators know they had headed to Norfolk where they had robbed a home of several expensive items. They knew they were wanted. They saw their pictures everywhere and this just kind of excited them more than scared them. Joanna loved the attention of it all and they robbed another home in Hertfordshire before heading to Hereford. And when they were there, they picked up this man named Mark Lloyd, who was good at selling stolen goods. He was basically a fence. So he would go and sell these stolen goods for them. But when he realized what they had done and what they were doing, he had to be drug along because he didn't want to be a part of it. So he was witnessing everything as it happened. They all stopped at a gas station to get some food and money and steal some things and CCTV footage actually caught Joanna at the cash register, basically already ramping up her anger. She was threatening her, she was pointing at her, yelling at her, and you could see that Mark was just kind of being like held back from talking to the cashier by her so he didn't say anything. Shortly after this, the two men walking their dogs were attacked. When Joanna was arrested, her ex-boyfriend and the father of her children, John Treanor, was actually texted by her sister informing him of everything. And when he began to hear about the murders and where the bodies were found, he realized something horrific. He realized that the dumping ground for these bodies was where Joanna would take their children often. 
when she had anything to do with it. Now, when Joanna was arrested after she was found in the car, the two men with her, one was 47-year-old Gary Stretch, whose real name was Gary Richards, but he went by Stretch because of how massive of a man he was, and another man named Mark Lloyd, the man who, of course, was brought into this to fence the stolen goods, they made a break for it. They jumped in another car, they sped off, there was a car chase, and then suddenly Gary got out of the car, started running. He was a seven foot two man, he wasn't athletic, and so shortly after they caught him, and he basically just put his hands up and said that he and Joanna were going to be Bonnie and Clyde. The men were brought in for questioning and they claimed that that day in Hereford, Joanna suddenly decided she wanted to find someone else to kill and told Stretch to pull over. Now, that is when she stabbed Robin, just without a thought, got back in the car and told Stretch to keep driving to find someone else. At this point, she also took a selfie of herself in the middle of a killing spree. When they came up to John, she said to stop again. She got out and she stabbed him over and over, licking the blood off of the knife, taking the dog and getting back in the car. When a car passed by, she simply looked up and waved, not fearing being caught. That's when she said she actually wanted to kill nine men to be killing like Bonnie and Clyde and that she wasn't going to kill women, especially not women with children, only men. But first they needed to sell some items that they had stolen to make some money. And this was their first mistake because when they stopped at the house to fence the items, they were arrested. Gary gave them a motive saying that Joanna killed basically for entertainment, telling him that she wanted her fun and needed him to help her to get that with like the disposal of the body. Now they were all in custody and the trial was to be November 18th at the Old Bailey. Kevin Lee's wife, Christina, refused to go and let Joanna see her face and get that satisfaction and good thing too because Joanna showed up to the court smiling. She laughed at everything said including the details of the crime and then surprising everyone she pled guilty to all of the murders and the attacks. She was asked to repeat it by the judge who didn't believe she was actually pleading guilty and she said that's what she said. She said she didn't want to be controlled by anyone, even her own lawyer, who wanted her to plead not guilty. But her sister said that she actually wasn't surprised that Joanna did this because Joanna liked control. She always had and she wanted people to know that she was the boss. Gary testified about Joanna's manipulation of him and that he had no idea about the killings prior to disposing of the body. He knew of the attacks, but the killings prior to that, he didn't know she was going to kill until she called him saying she needed him to dispose of the body. It was also found that Joanna was actually on probation at the time of the murders. This was because she was convicted of assault and owning a dangerous dog, yet no one was watching her and she was off the rails killing people under probation. This was said to be trickled down to inexperienced staff, but before the trial, prison staff had also found that Joanna was keeping a diary. And in this diary, she was writing something scary. She was saying that she had a plan, a plan to escape. And to do so, she was willing to kill. In fact, Joanna knew that she needed a finger to get past the biometric system in the prison that was a security system. To do so, she said she was willing to kill a guard or just simply cut off their finger and take it with her. Either way worked. Thankfully, this plan was read and she was placed in such solitary confinement for two years while the trial went on so she wouldn't do this before she was sentenced. Ultimately, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole at Bronzefield Prison. Judge Justice Spencer said, although you pleaded guilty, you've made it quite clear you have no remorse. You are a cruel, calculating, selfish, and manipulative serial killer. He said she should never be released, that she lacked a normal range of human emotions, and her accomplice, Leslie Layton, the one that had initially told investigators where to go to look for them, was sentenced to 14 years, whereas Gary Stretch was given two life sentences and the possibility of parole in 19 years. The victim's family spoke out of after this sentencing and Kevin's family and his son were very vocal about how they felt. His son Dino said that his dad tried to help everyone, but some people just can't be helped and he believed the justice had been served, but they have been having to be so strong and lean on one another during this horrible time 
and Eno said that it was very, very hard, but on the anniversary of his father's death, there's actually one of the most important go-kart races of the year, and he said that he's going to compete for his father, and he intends to win for him. He said when he's karting, he feels that his dad is still there, and this is actually what the Lee family had to say to the public. This has been an incomprehensibly difficult time for our family as we try to come to terms with what has happened to Kevin. Nothing is the same now. This tragedy has shaken our lives to the core, and we are devastated about how Kevin's life came to an end. Christina married Kevin in 1996, and they happily raised their daughter Chiara and their son Dino. Kevin was Christina's first relationship, and she is devastated that Kevin has been taken away from us as a family. Initially, after discovering the circumstances of Kevin's death, she felt a lot of anger, but is slowly managing to deal with that. As a family, we feel an immense pressure to fill so many voids which no one could ever really replace. Kevin was so full of life, excitement and laughter that life is now very dull without him around. He was headstrong, intelligent, unique, and his charisma ensured that everyone he ever met would never forget him a true one-off. We live every day with a devastating effect that this has had on our family. Christina, Chiara and Dino are now in a very different place. They struggle every day to deal with our loss and every day we all try and pick up the pieces. Dino has lost not only his dad, but his best friend, his karting mechanic and his most enthusiastic and encouraging mentor. Dino and Chiara have in essence lost both parents because Christina hasn't been able to deal with her own grief. Almost 12 months have passed and she's still not coming to terms with the loss of Kevin. Joanna Dennehy has taken over our lives and has callously created a hole that cannot be filled. She tried to humiliate Kevin in a way that wasn't deserved. Kevin gave everyone a chance, no matter how vulnerable, which sadly led to him losing his life. I'm sure all of those people he helped will remember how much he helped them. His friends and family are, were absolutely blessed to know the true person he was and will remember him always and miss him each day. Now, Joanna has come out saying that her time, her two years in solitary confinement, were tearful and upset, saying that she started self-harming again, and she tried to say that her human rights had been violated. However, the lawyer said that it was only done because if she did go through with her plan, she could be a threat to the public in general. Later in prison, Joanna would tell her fellow inmates she killed four people, yet we only know of three, so many wonder if there is another victim out there we have no idea about. But while talking to a psychiatrist, Interest, Joanna said that she killed because she wanted to see how it would feel to see if if she was just as chilly as she always assumed she was. She said it then obtained a lot Moorish, which I have no idea what that means, but yet even this wasn't all that would happen in prison. You see, Joanna had become friends with a fellow prisoner named Alexandro Kourieris. I don't know how to say her last name, I'm sorry. But Alexandra had been a lecturer at Hadlow College, known to be highly intelligent, especially with science. She was a 35-year-old mother, but on July 11th, 2015, she had gone to Maidstone Hospital to check out her broken arm. When doctors looked it over, they saw x-rays, they said it's actually not broken, it's fractured. And this is when Alexandra flew into a rage. She turned to Dr. Wamda Elhag and called her a Muslim and black African who knew nothing. Now, Dr. Wamda immediately left the room and Alexandra ran after her, spinning her around and punching her in the nose. Another nurse tried to help her and was actually bitten by Alexandra. At this point, the security guard stepped in, sat her down in the wheelchair, and that's when she started doing an African accent making fun of the doctor. Police were called, they tried to get hold of the situation, but they too were attacked by Alexandra. She kicked them, she spit on their faces, and she was also being racist toward another officer. They finally got her into a police van in a cell, and she asked for a cup of water only to throw it back at the officer. It was found that she was intoxicated at this time, but she was still going to be charged with assault causing actual bodily harm, racially aggravated assault, racially aggravated harassment, three offenses of assault by beating, and one offense of assault with intent to resist arrest. 
The judge told her that the hospital staff expect those who attack, injure, or insult them to be severely punished, and they are right to do so because he said it was an ugly picture that she should be ashamed of. Alexandra was given 18 months in jail, and there is where she met Joanna, specifically in the prison gym. They were believed to be in a relationship of sorts, and they were inseparable. Eventually, though, Alexandra had served her sentence and was released. However, she would come back to talk to Joanna and visit her. And one day while she was visiting, there was actually a security alert because she had tried to give Joanna a ring, one of her rings, even though she was married. She was told after this she couldn't visit Joanna for three months and Alexandra has since said that Joanna's just a friend and that she liked her ring and that is why she gave it to her. However, she also split from her husband at this time and she was said to be writing a fiction novel about a woman who had sex with men before murdering them. And obviously this sounds a lot like Joanna. In 2008, Joanna was with another woman and she wanted to marry this woman. This was her cellmate, Haley Palmer. And that same year, both of them made a suicide pact. They went through the plan, but they both did survive. Joanna was found with her throat cut and Haley's wrists were, and they were both on the floor together, which was covered in blood. They were raced to the hospital and they were returned back to the prison and they were also thinking about putting Joanna in a psychiatric unit because she had tried once again to take her life, but they were definitely separating the two of them. The next year, she was actually sent to a different prison. This was Low Newton Prison, and this is where the infamous Rosemary West was actually located, but Joanna threatened to kill her, so they ended up moving her. And by 2020, Joanna had entered another relationship. This time, it was with a 25-year-old named Emma Aitken, who was in prison for being part of a murder. Now, as I told you, Joanna did have children, even though she didn't have much contact with him. And one of her daughters, Cheyenne, actually came forward this year in 2021. She is now 21 and she wanted to talk about how she actually feared turning into her mother at one point. She had been told what her mother did when she was 13 years old. She fell on the ground crying and she said that she was beginning to worry that that was her future as well. She said, I have experienced from mental health and fitness troubles, from eating problems to self-harm to despair, stress, paranoia. I imagined I was going to convert into her and she thought maybe I must end it now, get it about and finished with so I really don't harm anybody. Thankfully, she didn't go through with it and I think that it says a lot about her character, her integrity, her heart and her mind that she fears being like that. She actually believes that her mother should spend the rest of her life in prison because she can't ever forgive her for hurting those people. Now, I also found a fan page for Joanna on Instagram and I just wanna thank all of you for not idolizing serial killers. I know that it's something that is a horrific part of the true crime community and I really appreciate all of you for putting the victims first and aren't giving the true crime community a bad name by idolizing these killers and giving them attention, but instead bringing light and justice to the victims who deserve it. It's something that's really beautiful and I appreciate all of you so much for doing that because I never want to be a part of the other side of the community. And we may talk about the killers and their psychology, but at the end of the day, they don't matter. They don't matter as much as the lives that they took or almost took because the survivors matter too. So let me know what you think about this case, how you think this normal child with a normal upbringing suddenly snapped when she was a teenager and turned into this horrendous woman. How many do you think she would have killed before stopping or do you think she would have needed to be stopped? But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.